Honey, can you get that? Mom, someone's in the front yard. Family photos. Yes, you are. No. Yes, you are. Mom! Why aren't you guys ready yet? Not an accident. Quit telling your sister she's an accident. Ugh. Hey, get out of there. Other people need to use the bathroom. Let's have kids, we said. It'll be fun, we said. Shut up. Kate, Kate, Kate. We're missing one. <clears throat> Stand up straight, stand up straight. You have to get closer to your brothers. I hate you. If I hear one more word, I swear. Everybody smile. Finishing up the battle for home this weekend as we've been talking about family and we're all from a family, we're all part of a family. I think most of us at our core, regardless of what we believe about Jesus, wanna do right by our family. We wanna be good dads, we wanna be good husbands, good wives, good aunts, good grandparents, whatever that is. And so we're trying, for those of us that are Christians, we're trying to figure it out as well. And yet it's hard, it's, it's complicated. And as we look around the world, uh, you can just see the evidence that there is a battle for home and that many are struggling and we might even say that many are losing. And for those of us that are followers of Jesus that are trying to live Jesus-centered lives, we've been really trying to come back to one big idea that we're just saying a lot of different ways to try to put it into your soul. And if you've got your notes, go ahead and grab those. But this is really what we've been trying to drive at through the course of this series. It's this, that we recognize the priority of the home in God's plan. That we just, we know this as we read the Bible from Genesis 1 all the way to the end of it, at the end of Revelation, we, we look and we see, man, there's a priority for God in his plan, in the way he wants to see uh, the Christian message go through the world, that he wants to do it through homes. He wants to do it through families. And so we've talked about the structure of home and the point of home and how it's to be this primary place of promotion of the gospel. And we've even asked you to pray along with us that you would pray that your home would be a place of promotion of the gospel and, and that God's spirit would guide you in closing the gap from what is to what it should be. And, and then we spent some time talking about marriage and how that relates and plays into the battle for home and the privilege and opportunity we have to be incredible spouses and to honor God with that and to enjoy God in that. And then last weekend, we spent some time talking about parenting and this incredible opportunity that we have to, to um, model what it means to follow Jesus and then to be just imperfect people pointing people to a perfect God. And that's just what it comes down to is the imperfect pointing to the perfect. And as we say a lot, because we I think the stuff that we're talking about is, is helpful and is biblical. If you've missed it, go back and catch up on the app or the website. And, and here's, here's what I know is I've had a lot of conversations with people over the course of this series. It's something that I feel in my own soul is that many times over the, the course of the last three weeks, you're hearing these things and you're going, yes, I want that. Yes, I want that to be true in my marriage. Yes, I, man, we, we should probably turn and go after that with our kids. And yes, I, I wanna be that kind of grandma or that kind of grandfather. I, I can do better with my, my, my nephews and nieces. And you're, you're like inspired, you're convicted, you're drawn, you're encouraged, you're pushed. And then you just wonder like, why is it at the end of the day you end up not doing what you wanna do? Why is it that you, you agree with these principles that like, yes, this is the stuff should, that should happen with my spouse. This is what should happen with my kids. But at the end of the day, it doesn't happen. And so that's what we wanna think about this weekend is how do we actually maybe deal with and dig into what's underneath the reason that this stuff doesn't happen in our homes the way we would say we want to have it happen. Why is there a gap? And so let's get after that. 
A few weeks ago, uh, I, I told a little bit of a story, but I wanna kind of laser in on this story because it'll set the stage for, I think, what's underneath so much of why we struggle with the battle for home. Uh, I shared in, in passing that my family uh, had decided in the Christmas season to go to uh, the big local display of Christmas lights. And many of you know what I'm talking about. You go there and you drive your car through it and it's like, you know, 20 minutes and music and the whole nine yards. And so we decided we'll make some family memories and we'll go out after that as a family. And so uh, Kel had done some research and she found out, hey, look, they open at 5.30. If we can get there a little early, we'll avoid the line. Let's get after it. So we do the research and we figured out, I said, okay, come home. So we decide we're gonna leave and try to get there to get in line with the cars at five o'clock. So come home from work uh, and my parents are gonna come with us. And so my parents and then the six of us, all eight of us get in the minivan. Now we're not even 15 seconds into the car and you start to hear, He's sitting too close to me. He's in the seat I wanna be in. Why is she sitting there? I wanna sit back there. He just kicked me. Is it really gonna be like this? Do we have to go? And we're like, we haven't even left the driveway, right? So then we drive, we get there, we take the you know, 15 minute drive or so from our home and we get there and the line of cars has started, but we get there pretty early and, and I hear one of them say, are you kidding, we have to wait in line? I'm like, this is going great so far. I think, okay, I'll be fun, dad. Let's just do some Christmas music in the car. So I start playing through Apple Music various Christmas songs to try to get us in the spirit and I'm trying to pick songs that I know people in the car like. And as soon as I pick one song, one of the family members says, I don't like that song. That song's dumb. That's not the right version. Can we listen to this song? I never liked that one's too long. Why are we doing this? Do we really have to be here? It's about 510 right now. <laughs> start to move a little bit forward as the gates are getting ready to open and they start to go. And the first, I have to go to the bathroom is announced from the back seat. Luckily, as we start to move forward, there are some porta potties and so we can figure it out. And so we say, hey, we'll drop the two or three of you off that have to go, we'll keep rolling, you can catch up with us. And so as they go to get out of the van, you kicked me, why do you have to go? Can't you hold it? This is stupid, whatever. Get out, we start to roll and we keep moving. A few times my dad looks at me and says, Christmas memories are so fun, aren't they, son? We get up to the front of the line finally to get ready to go in and one of my children shouts from the back, we have to pay for this crap? <laughs> go in, we're not very far in and one of the children decides, you know what, I see another car, they're standing in the back of the truck and so I'll just get up in the minivan and open the sunroof and I'll stand in the sunroof and I'll look out and so they decide to do that and that triggers one of the other children to say, you're in my way, would you please sit down? So now they're fighting. I look back, the oldest has his AirPods in at this point and could give a rip, he's completely done. I remind them in the middle of this, we're supposed to be having fun. And then the next, I have to go to the bathroom surfaces. And this one is from the littlest, Cammy, who's already gone, but decides she needs to go again. We're neck deep into the cars, cars all around, no porta potties in sight. Cammy is crying in the car, saying, I must go to the bathroom. It got so bad that finally Kelly said, here is a bottle, let's figure out what to do. She proceeds to go in the car. We make it through the entire light display. We decide to pull out and I have the genius idea. Who wants to get food? Well, normally that's always a win. Everyone does say yes and then it starts happening. The division and politicking for where we will get the food. The votes start coming from all parts of the car. There's yelling, there's crying, there's screaming. Dad makes a decision. To do this, we're gonna have to go out and we're gonna have to go right. And when we go right, little did I know when I ordered it to pick it up, I was gonna put us in about 25 minutes of traffic standstill. So now I've done that, everyone's even more and more agitated and I decide it looks like this would be a good moment to break the law and to go into the left lane where this is uncoming to get to the intersection so I can get across. I do, I go across only to the words of my endearing wife in the background. What are you doing, you moron? Make it across safely, get across, swing around, get the food, go home, stuff our face, and everyone's miserable. <laughs> now here's what I know. You have your own story if you have a family. You have your own story in marriage. You have your own story with your grandchildren. You have your own story. And here's the truth of what happens so often in our lives. Ready, guys? So often, the plan we think is gonna be awesome ends up being awful. So often the plan we think is going to be awesome 
ends up being awful. And it's just not about a fun night where you go to see the lights. It can be family game night. It can be a vacation where you've saved and planned and dreamt and you get there only to have it go all wrong. It can be a date night where you thought the date night was going to be great and you expected it to be awesome. And by the end of the night, instead of cuddling in bed, you're sleeping on the couch. It can be a conversation that you knew you needed to have with the kids. It was already going to be difficult, but it ends up being worse. It can be a conversation with the in-laws. It can be a weekend away. It can be whatever it is, but we think it's going to be awesome and it ends up being awful. I know that for some of us, we hear talks like we're hearing in this series and we say, okay, we're gonna get after this. We're gonna change. It's gonna be awesome, but it ends up not going quite as scripted. And the notes that you took and tried to apply, it becomes very difficult to see executed at home. Now, you know this, and again, this isn't a Christian reality or not, but here's just a truth as it relates to our plans. Ready? The, the plans, well, they involve people. <laughs> They involve people and people aren't robots and people have desires and people have passions and people have thoughts and people have bad days and people are tired and people didn't sleep well the night before and something happened to your daughter at school that she didn't tell you about and something happened to your son at practice and something's going on with their grades and a boy that they thought liked them doesn't like them and they saw something on Twitter and they saw something on Instagram or you had something at work or you didn't get a good night's sleep or someone was coming down with a cold, whatever it is, the plan involves people. They're not robots and different things go on. And then let me just remind all of us of this for those of us that understand what the Bible says about people. Not only does the plan involve people, the plan involves sinful people. People who are broken, people who are dysfunctional, people who have corrupt thoughts and ideas And let me also remind all of us, because this is where we need to go this weekend, that one of the people that's involved in those plans is you. And in case you're wondering, I'll just clear it up. You're not perfect. And you bring your garbage, and you bring your problems, and you bring your flaws, and you bring your sin, and you bring all of that into that space just like they did. In fact, what I really want to make sure that we understand this weekend is that what we all have to be committed to in our homes is putting down the binoculars and picking up the mirror. Putting down the binoculars and picking up the mirror. It is very, very easy to blame him or her or them, rather than looking and saying, what part of this situation in the car with those Christmas lights is on me? Now, here's the principle that I want us to get hold of this weekend as it involves trying to figure out how to win the battle at home, ready? The battle for home begins first in your own heart. It begins in your heart. It begins in you dealing with your garbage. It begins with you processing your emotions and your maturity. (laughs) Life is not Pinterest. (laughs) Life doesn't go the way it's scripted. And all the challenges that everybody has, you have them and you come home and we want to blame everyone else, but we need to look in the mirror and say, what am I contributing that is keeping my marriage from being what my marriage should be? What am I contributing that is keeping my parenting from being what my parenting should be? What is keeping me from being the brother or the son or the uncle that I should be? It starts in my heart. Because there's something that we all have in our heart that scripture says is at the source of our frustration, our divisions, and our fighting. It's at the source of our battles. And by the way, it's at the source of our battles, not just at home, but at the office and in the gym, and at the ball field. And it's in our heart that we have to deal with. I invite you to grab your Bible to turn on or turn to the book of James in the New Testament. Book of James. Love the book of James for so many reasons, but one of the reasons I love it is it's practical and it's gonna give us some really clear, principled 
teaching around this idea of making sure that we get after it in our own hearts first. And James, the, the brother of Jesus, is writing to the early church and he's just walking through what does it mean to follow Christ? What's it mean to live as a Christian? And then in this part of the end of, middle to the end of chapter three, he starts talking about wisdom. And he, and he starts going through, if you're gonna live a wise life, a wise life is gonna live to a, a blessed life, a good life. It's gonna be the life that makes sense. And, and in the middle of that, all the way through the bulk of chapter four, he's gonna wrap the, the bulk of his teaching in a single theme. And that theme is something that drives your ability to interact well with people beginning at home. And it's the theme of humility. It's the theme of humility. And then he's gonna drive as he moves from some of the nice ways he's interacted with them in the first few chapters of the letter to being very direct with them. And here's what he's going to say to them beginning in James chapter four, verse one. Here's the words he says. What causes fights and quarrels among you? What an awesome question. I mean, it is a great question. That's a great psychological, sociological question. In an environment, what causes fights among you? In the minivan that night, what caused the fights among us? In the living room, over the dinner table, in the office, in your marriage, on date night, what causes the fights and the quarrels among you? Why is it that it's so hard to get along? Why is it so hard to love the way we talked about last week? And why is it so hard to be patient? Why is it so hard to be kind? Why is it so hard to honor? Why is it so hard to, to do the things that we are supposed to do and not get angry? Well, he's going to tell us. He says, don't, don't those fights and quarrels and divisions, don't they come from the desires that battle within you? <laughs> We are awesome at saying it's the, their fault. The kids. She doesn't understand what I went through today. If she did, she wouldn't have talked like that. She wouldn't be, it's them, it's them. And James says, no, it's not. The source of your battles, the source of your struggles, the source of your division, it's within you. It starts with what you think. In fact, James is gonna flesh this out even more and here he keeps going. You desire, but you don't have, so you kill. Now he's not actually saying that when you don't get your way, you go actually off them or kill them, but I trust I'm not the only parent or husband at some point that has mentally done away with my family. Okay, I'm the only one, it's fine, I'll see a counselor. I mean, I've thought through it. I've processed it out. I know where the bodies would be left. It'll be fine. I'm joking, but I mean, come on, be honest. We've all had the verbal scrap with our spouse in our head or the things that we want to say or the way we want to tell them off. And he says, that comes because you desire what you want and you don't get it. And sometimes that desire is as simple as I don't want to hear that song. Sometimes that desire is I just wanna be left alone. Sometimes that desire is I have to have a hard talk and I don't wanna have it, but whatever it is, he says, when you have that desire, it wages war inside of you and then you take it out on them. And he keeps going here and here's what he says. You covet, you look and you say, that's what I want. I want that. I wanna be left alone tonight. I don't wanna eat that food. I don't want vacation to have an itinerary. Whatever it is, he says, you want it. And you cannot get what you want. So you quarrel and you fight. He says, you look and you can't get what it is you need. And because you don't get what you want, because you are, here's the word, here's the word, selfish. Because you're selfish. Now see, what we do with that word is it's kind of like greed. You know some greedy people, you're just not one of them. Because greed's kind of a moving target. Selfish is kind of a moving target. So you know some selfish people, but you would never label yourself selfish. You would say sometimes you're selfish, but the truth is you're selfish. I'm selfish. And James says what, what ticks me off about my kids and what ticks me off about my wife and what makes me mad if I'm honest about y'all sometimes is you don't do what I want. And I'm selfish. 
And he says, when that selfishness is in you, you become the kind of person that can't win the kind of battles you have to win at home because all you see is yourself. And so that he gives this principle that he rolls out with humility all throughout this, but he starts it right here. He says, so you quarrel, you don't have because you don't ask God. He's not talking about some simple prayer that goes like this that a lot of us would do. Dear Jesus, fix my wife, amen. <laughs> Dear Lord, just fix my teenager to be a grown up today. Not, no, 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 he's not saying, listen, he's not saying fix them. He's saying fix you. He's saying expose your selfishness. Go to the Lord and get on your knees. In fact, the next verses that follow is how grace comes to the humble. Those who recognize their selfishness and say, the solution to be able to interacting with the people that you're fighting with is that you would go to God and say, God, how could you change me? I've said it multiple ways already, but here's the problem with why we struggle to do all these things at home, ready? The struggle is rooted in selfishness. It's rooted in selfishness. And so you've seen these all series. And you've seen that in different ways, the battle goes on and we put the gloves on. So why do we put the gloves on? We put the gloves on because we're fighting for what we want. I don't want Italian. Let's roll. <laughs> I don't want to pick up the dog's poop. I want to sit on the couch. Let's go. Yes, I want you to have sex with me tonight. Let's go. No, no, no. I, I don't want them to stay at our house. Let's go. I don't wanna be here, Dad. I wanna be at home playing Fortnite. Let's go. What's all this come from? Why do we put these on? Why does it happen when we're like, I want a good marriage. I wanna love my kids. I wanna be patient with my kids. I don't wanna be angry with my kids. I wanna honor them. I wanna be obedient to God. I wanna love Jesus. But you're selfish. And when the selfishness shows up, the gloves come on. And when the gloves come on, the fighting starts. And suddenly that idea of the marriage that you want, the next thing you know, you're doing this. Why? Because you didn't get what you wanted. Because I didn't get what I wanted. Because our kids didn't get what they wanted. And this is what you know. Selfishness is like a gateway drug. <laughs> Once it enters, Quickly behind selfishness is rudeness. And quickly behind selfishness is anger. And quickly behind selfishness is passive aggressiveness. And quickly behind selfishness is a lack of loyalty and a lack of kindness. So we have to say, how do I deal with my selfish ambition? In fact, just a few verses before, in James chapter three, verse 16, James said this, where selfish ambition is present, you will find disorder and evil of every kind. In other words, if there's selfishness in the van, there are gonna be problems in the van. If there's selfishness around the living room, there's gonna be problems in the living room. So we can say, I wanna be a great dad. I wanna be a great spouse. I wanna be a great grandma. But then when the rubber meets the road, you don't get what you want in those moments. So what is it that we need to do as we start to work through this? Well, I think there's a couple things that I just wanna practically give before I really get to the solution to it. But here's a couple things I'm learning about when I'm being selfish that are, that are helping me. I think they'll help you as you navigate this idea of when those corals show up, what is it that you begin to do? Well, here's the first thing that I think you need to do. You need to admit the reality that you're being selfish. Stop blaming them and admit the reality that you're being selfish. Admit that when it starts to happen, you're putting the gloves on. And say you're being selfish. I had a friend one time who was talking to me about solving problems. And he said, I've found that the best way to solve problems is to say the things that you're dealing with out loud. 
What's the problem? Say it out loud. What's the solution? Say it out loud. If you did that, say it out loud. He just taught me. He said, say it out loud. Actually say it out loud. Say what is going on. So here's what I'm gonna teach all of us to say right now, okay? The next time that at home, you start to feel it and you get ready to grab the gloves and you get ready to start fighting and you feel the division and you feel the quarrel and you can tell it. Here's what you need to say out loud to whoever it's with. You need to look at him and go, I'm getting mad because I'm selfish. Say it to him. Look at him. Your wife will pass out. (laughs) I'm getting mad right now because I'm not getting my way. And then if you get really good at it, you can start adding like all the facts. I'm mad because I wanted to come home and watch TV and you won't let me. I'm mad because I wanted to come home to peace and quiet and it looks like a bomb went off. I'm mad because I didn't want to spend all this money to go out to eat here. I'm mad because I didn't want to go on this vacation. I'm mad because I don't want your parents here. I'm mad because I wanted to have sex and you won't. I'm mad because they didn't listen to me and and, and I think that the only way I'm a good parent is if they listen to me right away and they're not and I'm mad because I'm not getting my way. Just start saying it. I heard this in a sermon a few years ago that the pastor that was preaching it, he just said, just start saying it. Just start saying it out loud. Like the fight starts to happen. You grab the gloves, you get ready. Just look at them. I'm I'm getting mad because I'm not getting my way. Just admit the reality. You'll be amazed what it starts to do to that conflict in that moment. But more than that, you'll be amazed what it starts to do to your own heart. Because you can't solve selfishness you're not aware of, but if you start calling selfishness what it is and you say it out loud and you admit it, just say, I'm being selfish. I'm being selfish. And sometimes, sometimes it's great. I'll say, Kel, I'm being selfish. I know. <laughs> and then sometimes, because she's awesome, she'll say, and I'm gonna let you be selfish right now. I love when she says that. <laughs> Other times she says, yeah, knock it off. We put on the gloves because we're being selfish. So the first thing we need is we need to admit the reality because the battle for home begins in our heart and the struggle begins with our selfishness. So we need to admit the reality. And then the second thing, and this is hard, all right? This is like, if this is a, a hundred level class, this is a 200 level class, ready? The second one is this, we gotta acknowledge the reason. It's one thing to say I'm being selfish. It's another thing to start acknowledging why am I being selfish? This is where you start to dig at it. You start to go below the surface. It's one thing to look at the symptoms of why you wanna pick up the gloves. It's another thing to actually get out the MRI on your heart and process what's up, to get out the x-ray machine. See, my symptoms are I'm dizzy, my symptoms are I'm limping, my symptoms are I'm tired, I have fatigue. Yeah, those are the symptoms. What's the problem? Sometimes the symptom is you're selfish, but there's something underneath that that's driving that diagnosis. Over the course of this series, we've brought up a few of these. Sometimes where we as parents are selfish is if we're honest, it's just our pride. Like with our kids, we don't wanna lose. We wanna hold on to our power position. So we're selfish just to try to defend our position and our pride. Sometimes we're we're selfish with our kids because the truth is, and I mentioned this last weekend, we're more concerned about our reputation than we are about theirs. So how they play on a ball field is less about how good they are and how good we look. So we get selfish to yell at them and defend that. Sometimes in our marriage, we're selfish because we have unforgiveness. We haven't dealt with something that happened six weeks ago or six months ago. And so then we've got selfishness that's rooted in that. Sometimes we're selfish because we're not spending time with the Lord and we don't have a healthy relationship with Jesus and we're not receiving from him. Sometimes we're selfish because we're tired and we need a nap and we need to relax and we need to chill out. Sometimes we're, we're selfish because we're lazy. And the truth is what we have to do in that moment is hard. But we gotta, we gotta get to the reason so we can begin to deal with it. But the truth is the problems in our home that keep us from winning is we put on the gloves And the gloves are rooted in our selfishness. And if we're gonna start to move through that, we gotta say out loud, admit it, I'm being selfish. And then we gotta start to acknowledge the reason behind my selfishness. Now that starts to get us there, but I think there's a principle that's beyond even that if we're gonna win at being the kind of people that win the battle at home. The apostle Paul teaches us this principle that is a principle all over the pages of scripture. 
And when you go there, you're gonna go, yep, I've heard that taught at Grace before. Yep, I've, I've, I've thought about this. Very familiar verses that are just the, the principle of how we as Jesus-centered people are supposed to live our lives in connection to everyone. And again, unfortunately, what we are good at doing is taking these verses and putting them into every other area of our life rather than our families. So what is it that happens that we need to consider? Well, let's go to Philippians chapter two. Philippians chapter two, and here's what we are doing in our selfishness. We have the gloves on and we're ready to fight. And in those moments of our selfish ambition and our vain conceit and our anger, we're ready to go. And Paul shows up and here's what he says to us. Do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit. So you start to recognize and admit I'm being selfish. I'm acknowledging the reason I've got to process this and deal with this. And he says, in that moment, when you see it and you start to go after it, you've got to say to yourself, you know what you're doing? You're, you're acting out of a selfish place and God doesn't want you to do that. That's not what Christians do. That's not what Christ follows. That's not those who follow Jesus do. So then he continues to build this and he says this, but rather... Instead, and we talked about this last weekend, right? Our, our children will mimic our behaviors more than our beliefs. And so instead, what do we do? Rather, he says this, in humility, remember James, it was all wrapped in humility. In humility, value others above yourselves. I want to. No. Put them down and see them. Put them down and say, they matter more than me. Put them down and say, where they wanna eat is more important than where I wanna eat. Put them down and say, what they need help with is more important than what I wanna rest on. Others more important than yourself. And then he comes back and he says, not looking to your own interests, but each of you to the interests of others. Come on, guys. How game-changing would it be in our homes if we just lived these two verses? <laughs> Isn't this what parents we would hope would happen with our kids and their siblings? That they figure out how to do this? <laughs> Let me just enlighten us. That won't happen with them if we don't even do it ourselves. I'll tell you the antidote that Paul tells you that the scriptures tell you over and over is the deal to dealing with your selfishness that is the struggle to being able to win the battle at home. Ready? The solution to selfishness, what Paul's saying is service. So look outside yourself to see them and to say, how can I help them? How can I care for them? See, we follow a Jesus who didn't come to be served, but to serve. The notion of to love and to see other people is to see what they need and to elevate them above ourselves, to become humble and to say, how can I care about you? In fact, the visual that I would love to give you this week is I wanna invite you to put down the gloves and to pick up a towel. And instead of having gloves with selfishness in your home, to put the towel on and say, how can I serve? What would it look like in your home that when the gloves wanna get put on, you put down the gloves and you pick up the towel and you say, I'll watch the show you wanna watch. I know it's a game. I know it's a, it's a, it's a rom-com that I'm not interested in, but I will serve you. I'll absolutely get up and go put the kids to bed. Yes, we can have that conversation. Here's one that would just be crazy for me to be able to do, to put on the towel. I will sleep tonight without the fan on. Do you know how much Jesus would have to be coursing through my veins for that to happen? But see, it the gloves because it's what I want, it's what I want, it's what I want. But no, put the gloves down and pick up the towel. Yeah, what is it that you wanna talk about tonight, kids? What is it that you wanna process? Where is it you wanna go? How can I lean in and help you with what you want? How can I serve you where you are? Yeah, I know the conversation will be hard, but I know the right thing to do to serve and to have the towel is to do it, so we'll do it. I'll happily clean up the kids' room. What would it look like for your kids sometimes to put down the gloves and put on the towel and say, I know it's what mom and dad really want. 
Just imagine a house where a bunch of Jesus followers decided what we're gonna do is outdo each other with honor. You go first. You go first. Not how can I serve you? How's that begin? Well, you gotta admit you're being selfish. You gotta admit you're putting on the gloves and then you gotta put down the gloves and then you have to put on the towel and you have to say, I'll pick it up and I will serve in my home. Why is it we often don't win the battle for home? Why is it we don't have the marriages that we want? Why is it we don't have the parenting we want? Why is it siblings do what they do? Why is it that so many stories end up with kids and adults in a minivan frustrated that they were trying to do something as a family? Why is it that you have quarrels and divisions and wars within you? Because you're selfish. And selfishness puts on the gloves. And the only answer is to have Jesus show up in our hearts and change us in a way where we would put down the gloves and we would pick up a towel. So what is it I want you to do with this this weekend? Something simple, I've already driven at it. It could change the trajectory of your home. It'll make for some fun conversations. I can't wait to hear some stories when you start doing it, all right? Simple action step that we can all start to put into our homes is this. Make the phrase, I'm mad because I'm not getting what I want normal in your home. Just start saying it. There'll be some of us this weekend that won't even get to the house before we have to say it. Just say it. Put it in your home. I'm mad because I'm not getting what I want. What you're really saying is I'm being selfish. And that is a signal for you to say, I need to put down the gloves and pick up a towel. I need to go from wanting to be served to serve. I need to go from saying, what will you do for me to saying, what can I do for you? How do we win the battle at home? This sounds crazy. If we want our homes to look like Christian homes, we have to live like Christians. I know it's nuts. (laughs) And Christians serve. Here's what I know. I mean, I type all this onto my computer and it shows up on my iPad and I come up and say it and y'all listen to it. And then I, I know this, this is hard to do. And it's hard to do because of what I said earlier, we're sinners. It's hard to do because we are selfish. It's hard to do because the truth is we don't wanna do the things that we should do that honor God. It's crazy difficult. It's crazy challenging to live that selflessly, to not live for vain conceit and to consider the interests of others more important than yours. But it wasn't crazy for someone to do because Jesus did it. So if you say, I wanna live this way, I do. I wanna be able to put down the gloves and pick up the towel and I wanna be able to live in a way where I serve my family and I serve my spouse and and I'm a great grandma and I'm a great sibling and you wanna do that. I'm gonna tell you the secret to it. Your only hope to being able to do that because of how you're wired is this. The secret to picking up the towel is bowing down to the Savior. The secret to being able to do this (laughs) is in the words, less of us and more of him. How is it that I find my life, I lose it? How is it that every day I'm supposed to live to be this kind of servant? I take up my cross and follow Jesus. Every husband, every wife, every grandma, every grandpa, every aunt, every uncle, every sibling, every parent, I'll just tell you the truth you don't have the capacity to be the kind of servant you wish you could be in and of yourself. You don't. The great news is that if you're a Christian, God himself reigns inside of you and that when you walk with his spirit and you die to you and live in him, you can do it. That if you can stay connected to who Jesus is, Hebrews tells us, fix our eyes on the author and perfecter of our faith. And that when we look at his example, we will not grow weary in doing good. How is it that we serve? We fix our eyes on the servant above all servants. We bow down to Jesus and say, Jesus, my natural inclination is to pick up the gloves every day. And the only way I'll ever pick up a towel is to be near you, stick around you, follow you, fix my eyes on you and see what you have first done for me. I remember I was on a a trip with students I was leading years ago before I was a pastor here. And we were doing this project where we would go to various 
people in the community's homes and we would help them clean up their homes, mostly elderly folks who couldn't get out and about. We go to this one old woman's home and she gives us some things to do in her home. And then she says, would any of you be willing to, to cut my grass? And one of us said, absolutely, we'd be willing to cut your grass. And so we began to ask her, do you have a lawnmower? She said, I do have a lawnmower. And she takes us out and she walks us to this shed. And in the shed is one of those electric lawnmowers. It was dilapidated, it was old. She says, right over there's the extension cord. I'll take you to the plug. And she said, I know she doesn't look like much, but if you keep her plugged in, she'll cut the grass. I know that she doesn't look like much, but if you keep her plugged in, she'll get the job done. <laughs> I know I can never be the husband I'm supposed to be. I know I can never be the dad I'm supposed to be. I know I'll never be the brother or the son, but if I stay plugged into the source of godliness that is Jesus Christ himself, I'll do all right. I won't on my own. I want with more gusto and strength and bearing down and muscle. But if I stay connected to Jesus, if I fix my eyes there, there'll be a little bit more of putting down the gloves and picking up a towel if I can keep connected to Jesus. It's like a vicious cord on repeat in a church. The secret to your success in any area of your life is your ability to surrender to the Jesus who died for you. How do we win? We stay close to Jesus. We follow Jesus. We lean into Jesus. And only then will we have the strength to overcome all of our struggles and be the servants that can win the battle for home. So what we wanna do as we wrap up this weekend is just fix our eyes on Jesus. His grace, his love, his mercy, his hope that many of us have come to firsthand know and experience and that we'd be reminded as we close in song of the grace of God that transforms us and gives us the ability and the power to be able to lay down our selfishness and pick up service. And if you're not a Christian, I just invite you to consider this Christ who modeled everything I'm asking us to live by going first and dying for us while we were not interested. Let's pray together, guys. Jesus, our model for humility is you that you came to earth, that you were a servant, that you humbled yourself even to death on the cross. And in so doing, you offer grace. Grace that doesn't just transform us to make us forgiven, but it transforms us to be able to live as image bearers of you, representatives of you who could have the ability and opportunity and the power to seek and love and serve others more than ourselves. I pray for our homes and the gap between what is and what should be would be filled as those homes become places of promotion of the gospel. And that begins with our behavior, which is marked by love. And that love is marked by service. So Jesus, right now we dwell on you. We think about your grace and we recognize that we must fix our eyes on your passion and that you should be our only desire. We pray this in the name of Jesus, amen.